After the service, we will have the Supper of Remembrance. And we know that the purpose why the Lord Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper is primarily that we might remember Him. Do this in remembrance of me. That in remembering Christ, particularly in his death, which was central to his work of accomplishing salvation, we might feed our soul with Christ through faith. Now in order to help us then fulfill that purpose for which Christ instituted the supper, I will direct your attention to John chapter 19. John's Gospel, chapter 19, and we will consider verses 17 to 30. Beginning from verse 16, after the trial, so he, that is Pontius Pilate, so he then handed him over to them to be crucified. Jesus, they took Jesus therefore and went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. They crucified him and with him two other men one on either side, and Jesus in between. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It was written, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Therefore, many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews were saying to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. And the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his outer garments and made four parts, a part for every soldier, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to decide whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture, for they divided my outer garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus then saw his mother, the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. From that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill the scripture, said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. In this portion of God's word read in your hearing, John, under the infallible guidance of the Holy Spirit, gives us various scenes of the crucifixion and death of the Lord Jesus Christ. In analyzing what is the unifying theme for John's selection of the historical event, what to record 
There seems to be only one that emerges that is fully in accord with his purpose while he wrote the gospel narrative. And that is to show that Jesus is really the promised Messiah, the Son of the living God, and that we might continue to believe in him and have life in his name. So let us relive the events by entering into the narrative as if we ourselves were there when it happened. And you have to be with me here. Let's revisit Calvary. And remember our Savior. And let us ponder the significance of each of these events. Spelled out quickly. So first, let us consider the crucifixion of Jesus. In verses 9, 17 to 18, we read again, They took Jesus, therefore, and went out bearing his own cross to the place Called the place of skull. To a place called the place of skull. And then we further read. They crucified him. And with him two other men. One on the other side. And Jesus in between. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It was written, Jesus the Nazarene. Okay, so here we find a very brief in two verses, verses 17 to 18, John records very succinctly the crucifixion of Jesus. And in that great historical event, he tells us several things. First, that as Jesus went toward the place of his crucifixion, he bore his own cross. In verse 17, we read, They took Jesus, therefore, and he went out bearing his own cross. In other gospel narratives, we are told that along the way, somewhere along the way, Jesus had to be helped by Simon the Cyrene in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But we are just told here that Jesus, but here in John's gospel narrative, we are just told that Jesus bore his own cross. Now, is that a contradiction? No. They are all harmonious and complementary. The picture is that Christ bore most of the cross, most of the way, this cross, most of the way until his body could no longer endure. And that is when a bystander had to be pressed to carry his cross at least part of the way. But just relive the moment and see the determined obedience of the Savior to do his Father's will. To lay down his life for the sheep. As we have read earlier in our morning worship in Philippians, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Let us never forget that for days he had been determined to go to Jerusalem in order to fulfill his father's will. And he bore it. And then we are also told secondly in the account of the crucifixion that Jesus was crucified in a place called the place of skull. Again, verse 17. 
we are told they took Jesus therefore and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of skull which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. The specific place where Jesus was crucified is called the place of skull. In Hebrew, Golgotha, the place of skull. Now the Hebrew name of that place indicates that it was a place that the Jewish people were very familiar with, that it had a Hebrew name, a Jewish name. The place was very near Jerusalem, as indicated by verse 20. The English name Calvary is based in the Latin translation of that place, Calvaria, which also means place of skull. But the place was very familiar to the Jews that it had a Hebrew name. It was visible from outside Jerusalem. You can see the place. And although where exactly this place was is still a matter of debate, the point is that of great importance is that the place was a place of death. It was a place where criminals were executed. It was a place well known to the Jewish people because it was a place just outside the walls of the city of Jerusalem and visible from those walls. And elsewhere the Bible tells us that even that had an Old Testament significance. Hebrews 13. And we'll pass over this quickly. But Hebrews 13 indicates that even that place where it was had a significance. Hebrews 13 verse 10, writing to the believers, the Hebrew believers, telling them to abandon the old rituals of the old covenant and enter fully into the new covenant realities for the old covenant Rituals instituted by Moses was only temporary and was never meant to last. And therefore the Jewish people were no longer to identify with them, but identify with the new covenant realities and join even the Gentiles in the true worship of God. We read in verse 10, We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest as an offering for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, suffered outside the gate. So let us go out to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we do not have a lasting city. But we are seeking the city which is to come. He is telling the Hebrew Christians to move away from the shadows and cling to that which the shadows pointed to. The old covenant sacrifice, the remains were then. Well, you see, he says, go out of the camp. The offering of sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify his people through his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Everything was carefully planned. Even where he would die. And then thirdly about this crucifixion. Another scene in that crucifixion is that Jesus was crucified in between two other men. Verse 18. In verse 18 we are told that he was crucified between two men.
They crucified him, verse 18, and with him two other men, one on either side and Jesus in between. Other gospel narratives mention who these two men were who were crucified, but John did not include that particular detail. But what seems to be significant to John was that Jesus was treated just like an ordinary and common criminal. The Romans did not treat Jesus as someone special. They crucified him together with two other men, as if he was just like them. That is the shame and the humiliation that Jesus had to undergo. And even this was foretold by Isaiah the prophet, where we read that Messiah, the servant of Jehovah, who himself is Jehovah, is described as him who poured himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Isaiah 53. And how can anyone behold this and remain indifferent to Jesus? Remain indifferent. If you behold this scene with believing eyes, Will you at least ponder the question, why did Jesus have to go through all of this? And then find the answer to the question from the scriptures. And if you behold this scene with the eye of faith as to Christ, why Christ had to do this, then don't forget that what Jesus has done in history, he did in order to save you. In order to provide a just basis for the forgiveness of sin. But then that leads us to the next scene in the crucifixion and death of the Lord Jesus that John records. And the next scene is the controversy caused by the inscription on the cross. And here John expands. The controversy caused by the inscription on the cross, verses 19 to 22. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It was written, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Therefore, many of the Jews read this inscription. For the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews were saying to Pilate, Do not write, King of the Jews. But that he said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. Extra biblical sources tells us that it was the custom that the person who was to be crucified would carry around his neck a placard where the crime committed by the person to be crucified was written. And that person, when that person is crucified, that placard is nailed on the cross just above the head of the person crucified. The crime is crucified for. Now Pilate had the crime Jesus was accused of written in three languages. Jesus of Nazarene the king of the Jews. And Pilate had the crime Jesus was crucified for written in three languages. In Hebrew, the language in common use among the Jews, 
in Jerusalem. In Latin, the official or legal or formal language of the Roman Empire and Roman government. And then in Greek, the universal language of the whole Roman Empire. And what was written on the sign trilingually? What was written? Jesus the Nazarene. King of the Jews. That was his crime. And since the place of Jesus' crucifixion was near the city of Jerusalem, many people who visited the city during the feast, the Passover, could see and read the sign. Verse 20. Now, these prove rather disturbing and even insulting to the Jews. If the inscription said, I am king of the Jews, the implication is that it is a claim that Jesus made, is that it is just a claim that Jesus made as one of the many who has falsely claimed to be king of the Jews. And since his claim is not true, he is not the king of the Jews, although he claimed to be the king of the Jews, then he deserves to die. And the Jews were in agreement of it, and in fact, they demanded it. But if the inscription said that Jesus is king of the Jews, that would be most objectionable to the Jews. For that would imply that the Jew had no right whatsoever to have a king of their own because only Caesar is the rightful king. And that one who claims to be king of the Jews deserves death by crucifixion. Only Caesar is king. And anyone who claims to be king of the Jews deserves to die by crucifixion. And for the Jews to have a king of their own was therefore, that sign therefore implied that for the Jews to have a king of their own was therefore a crime worthy of the worst punishment. Crucifixion. And that was objectionable to the Jews. It was a denial of what they thought was their right to be once again a sovereign nation, to have a king. For them it was a denial of their hope that God will send a king, a descendant of David, who will reign over Israel, destroy all their enemies, even the Romans. It was a denial of their right and their aspiration to be once again a sovereign nation. Not under Rome, but a sovereign nation. Under God's sent king. Therefore, what did the officials do? Well, they wanted Pilate to change the inscription. Change it from Jesus of Nazarene, the king of the Jews, to Jesus of Nazarene, I am king of the Jews. 21, verse 21. And what is the difference between the two? Is this a distinction without a difference? No, as I have already indicated. It is a distinction with a difference. The implications were massive. 
if the inscription says Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, that implies that for the Jews to have a king of their own was a crime worthy of the worst punishment. But if the inscription says Jesus of Nazareth, I am the king of the Jews, then that statement would not be as loaded and insulting to the Jews. In fact, it would justify the crime of having him killed because he claimed to be king of the Jews when in fact it was a false claim. And therefore he deserved to die. But what was Pilate's response to the Jewish officials' protest? He refused to have the sign change, saying, What I have written, trilingually, in Hebrew, in Latin, in Greek, what I have written, I have written. Verse 22, when Pilate gave in, while Pilate gave in to the Jewish request or demand to have Jesus crucified, he did not bud. I'm sorry, when the Jews demanded Jesus to be crucified, he gave in. Although he knew that Jesus was innocent, he gave in. Because they cried, we have no king but Caesar. How can you not crucify this man who claimed to be king of the Jews? We have no king but Caesar. And Pilate gave in. But while he gave in to the Jewish demand to have Jesus crucified, he will not budge on this issue. But we don't know the thoughts of Pilate as to why he will not budge. The Holy Spirit does not tell us. And it's pointless to try to speculate. We don't want to psychoanalyze him. That's beyond us. But the thing to keep in mind is that here the Jews were only getting what they deserved. Because of what they said earlier in demanding for the crucifixion of Jesus. What did they tell Pilate was the reason why Jesus must be crucified? He claimed to be a king. Let's take a look at the language. 19 verse 12. As a result of this, Pilate made efforts to release him because he saw that Jesus was not guilty of a crime worthy of death. As a result of this, Pilate made efforts to release him, but the Jews cried out saying, If you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself out to be a king opposes Caesar. And then in verse 14, Now it was the day of the preparation for the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. So they cried out, Away with him. Away with him. Crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Note that the Jews themselves never really address the issue whether Jesus is really who he claimed to be, the king promised by God. That was never really addressed in Jesus' trial. The Jews did not want to address that issue in their zeal to have Jesus crucified. They made it appear that no Jew had a right to claim to be a king. For the only king that the Jews would ever recognize was Caesar. Therefore, why would they protest what Pilate wrote? Isn't this why he was crucified? He is the king of the Jews. 
Isn't that the reason why? The reason why you want him crucified is because you said, We have no king but Caesar. If you will not crucify this man who claims to be a king, then you are no friend of Caesar and you recognize no sovereign but Caesar. So they were only getting what they deserved. Therefore, Pilate will not but. That's the crime. That's the reason why he's crucified. He, king of the Jews. And for you, whether that's true or not, is not really the issue. Because anyone who claims to be king of the Jews is no friend to Caesar. And you recognize no other king but Caesar. And so in this, he would not pray. And in addition to this, we see in Pilate's refusal the sovereign hand of God who turns man's heart wherever he wishes. Proverbs 21 verse 1. Pilate gave in to the Jewish unjust demand to have Jesus crucified, but he would not give in to the Jewish little demand of having the sign on the cross changed. Why? Ultimately because God did not want it changed. Jesus is the true king of the Jews. The mediatorial king of God. His people who has authority over all the nations. And God wanted that truth proclaimed to all the nations. He is a king who was crucified. The king of God's people. So this is so the significance of the controversy caused by the inscription on the cross is something that you and I should ponder about. You should think about that. Jesus is king. The Lord Jesus never denied this. And in fact, he firmly asserted it earlier to Pilate. But his kingship and kingdom... As he also made clear to Pilate earlier, it's not like the kingdoms of the world. His kingdom is not preserved and promoted by the use of literal swords and spears and guns. But by the truth. And only those who are of the truth are truly his. Remember in John 18, earlier in the trial of Jesus, verse 33, Pilate entered, therefore Pilate entered again into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Are you saying this on your own initiative, but did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priest delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Therefore Pilate said to him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born, I have been born, and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, what is true? He is the king. Now, it is in this sense that Jesus is king of the Jews. Jews referring not primarily to the physical descendants of Abraham, but to all the spiritual descendants of Abraham. The promised seed of David who will reign over God's true people, who are the spiritual descendants of Abraham. 
And at the coming of Christ, that kingdom was formed. The Jewish unbelievers were cut off. And Jesus was king over the remnant of believing Jews. And the, un and the believing Gentiles were later grafted in. That's the kingdom he came to establish. Not a kingdom like David's kingdom. Where you have little or swords and spears to defend it, to promote it. But it is a spiritual kingdom. The reign of God in mercy, in grace, under the greater son of David. David's son, who is David's Lord. He is king. King of God's people, king of the redeemed community, king over all the nations. He is the rightful king. And God wanted that known to all the nations. And the question is, are you part of that kingdom? If you are of the truth as revealed by Jesus, then you are part of that kingdom. But if you're not of the truth as revealed by Jesus, then you are not part of it. You are not subject. To him, you are not part of his Kingdom. But then that leads us to the next scene in Jesus' crucifixion and death. The third scene, as recorded by John, has to do with the soldiers dividing Jesus' clothes between them. In verses 23, 23 to 24, then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his outer garments and made four parts. A part to every soldier and also the tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to decide whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture that divided my outer garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore, the soldiers did this thing. Therefore, the soldiers. Now, the idea here is not that the soldiers divided Jesus' outer garments by cutting them up into four equal parts. No, that would be of no use to the soldiers except as rags. The idea here is that Jesus' outer garment had four pieces of apparel, presumably the sandals, the belt, the head covering, and the external clothing. All four soldiers who crucified Jesus had each a piece. However, there was a fifth garment, the seamless tunic or the inner garment. There was no point of cutting it up into pieces. So who among the four should get it? Well, the soldiers decided to cast lots as to who will get it. Now this event seems rather insignificant. For it was customary for the Romans to strip a person crucified naked and to divide the garments among themselves. John explicitly points out the significance of this. This happened in order to fulfill the scriptures. And John quotes the scripture. And the quotation comes from Psalm 22. 
which is a psalm of David, written under the infallible guidance of, that, of the Spirit. In that psalm, David recorded in prophecy Messiah's prayer to God long before the exact event actually took place. And the experiences of Messiah are recorded by David as if it already happened. Let's take a look at just certain sections of Psalm 21. See, when David wrote this psalm, he was not speaking about himself, but he was speaking as a prophet and recorded events that will happen in the future, events that will happen in his distant son's experience. David's son and yet David's boy. Verse 1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my glory. And that's quoted in Matthew 27, the cry of Jesus. In verse 7, we read, All who see me sneer at me. They separate with the lip. They walk the head saying, Commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him because he delights in him. And again, that is recorded as that which happened in the life history of Messiah, Matthew 27. And then in verses 9 to 10, notice, Yet you are he who brought me forth from the womb. You made me trust when upon my mother's breast. Upon you I cast, I was cast from birth. You have been my God. From my mother's womb. Be not far from me. For trouble is near. Now this could not be something that David could say of himself. Because he says that he sinned. His mother conceived him. But here David is not obviously in the psalm. Speaking about his own life's experience. But he is writing in prophecy the experience of Messiah. Who stood as a representative sin bearer. And then in verse 18 of that psalm, we find this statement. In verse 18, they took, they stare at me, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing, they cast my. We have an amazing description of what will happen in Calvary through the prophecy of David. He saw this even before and long before it happened. And this is immensely significant. It indicates that all the events that happen in the life of Jesus even his sufferings, crucifixion, and death were not only prophesied by God, but they are all under the sovereign control of God. In Isaiah 46, verses 9 to 10, God said to the nation of Israel, Remember the former things long ago, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me. And what makes God so unique? He tells us, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying, My purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. Why is God able to declare from ancient times things which have not been done? Even the details of the crucifixion of Jesus, the cry that came out from his lips, my God, my God, why? The dividing of his clothes, the sour wine he was made to drink, the ravenous, brutal men, that were involved with his crucifixion. And even the experience described in Psalm, Psalm 
22 of the pain of crucifixion, my joints, or his body, his body was out of joint, the pain, the terrible thirst. Why? Could God declare it before it happened? Because God will accomplish in history all his good pleasure. Whatever will come to pass will come to pass. He can tell us exactly what will come to pass because everything that will come to pass he has purpose will happen and he will execute that plan and who can stop him. Declaring the end from the beginning ancient from ancient times, things which have not been done. Why? My purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. So at the crucifixion of Jesus, things did not get out of control. Every single detail was in accordance to God's plan and purpose. Will happen. And he made it, he already declared it in Psalm 22 to make us know what will happen before it happens. So when we look at this event in Jesus' crucifixion and death, it should have a twofold effect on us. First, abhorrence. And second, adoration. Abhorrence. On the one hand, abhorrence because of the callousness and selfishness of the soldiers. They had no compassion and pity at all for Jesus who was in terrible pain and spiritual anguish. They were only thinking about themselves. And what they can get the most of what was left of this dying, suffering man. And that is all, and that is what all of us will have become. Apart from the common grace of God that restrains and redirects the sinfulness of the human heart. If God were to remove those restraints, we would become like this callous. Men who will not even be moved to compassion in the face of suffering. Romans 1, God give them over to a perverse mind. The callousness of man, how evil man can become. If God were to remove the restraints of common grace, all the evilness and wickedness of man's heart will manifest itself. That's why some men who go to war without the restraints of a government and they see something of their own reaction to things around them, when they go home, they cannot live with themselves because they have seen how horrible their are. Look at these Roman soldiers with very diminished common grace. How callous they were. I want that. I want this. In the face of terrible suffering. But on the other hand, it should fill us with adoration because of the mysterious and glorious sovereignty of This despicable event happened under the mysterious and glorious sovereignty of God. Everything was moving according to God's plan and purpose from long ago. Revealed before it happened in prophecy. And from the darkest picture of human cruelty and callousness shines the brightness of God's kindness and love. 
and from the greatest crime man has committed, God predestined it to occur for the greatest good of mankind. That's the irony of God. The greatest crime to do the greatest good for humanity. So while we are downfound, downfounded, how callous this man had become, how little common grace was left in them. And yet it should also drive us to adoration. The greatest crime, the most wicked crime, in order to accomplish in God's purpose the greatest good of humanity. The irony of God. And then that leads us to the next scene. Okay? Maybe that's too fast for some of you, but we'll take this other scene. And John records under the infallible guidance of the Spirit in this scene of the crucifixion and death of Christ another instance. The care Jesus had for his mother. The care Jesus had for his mother. 19 verse 25b. Notice. Therefore the soldier did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother. And his mother's sister. Mary the wife of Clophas. And Mary Magdalene. When Jesus then saw his mother. And the disciples whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. From that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. Now, the Roman Catholic Church uses this portion of scripture as supposedly a biblical support for the call of Mary. When Jesus said to Mary, Behold your son, the Roman church say that what Jesus was doing was to commit John and in fact all the disciples of Jesus, present and future, to the care of Mary. Moreover, when Jesus said to John, Behold your mother, the Roman church say that what Jesus was doing was to tell John, and in fact all the disciples of Jesus, present and future, to look to Mary, to care for them with respect to their salvation, with respect to their redemption. That's for them, the church then has now been committed to the care and protection of Mary. In the words of Pope Pius IX, he says that by these words, Jesus makes Mary the patroness of all Christians who are here represented by John. In other words, the church is under the care of Mary. As one Roman Catholic puts it, in the person of John, Mary receives all Christians as her children. And this capacity of Mary entitles us to the right and the trust that we place all our interests, that is, temporal and eternal, in her hand. But I have never seen a more repulsive twisting of Scripture than this. For how did John understand the words of Jesus? Well, understood it to mean that Jesus was putting Mary under the care and protection of John. He was going to die. Mary was a widow. And therefore he told Mary to look to John as the one who will care for him. And he told John to look to Mary And care for her as if his own mother. And that is clear from the way John understood it 
in verse 27, he said to the disciples, Behold your mother, from that hour the disciple took her into his own house. It was not the responsibility of Mary to take care of John. John understood the words of Jesus to mean that now, since Jesus is going to die and Mary is a widow, he will have to take care of Mary. Treat her as if she were his own mother. And that Mary looked to John to care for him as if her own son. At that time, Jesus began his public ministry. There is no mention of Joseph. He must have been dead, have died early. And the eldest of the family, Jesus had the care of his widowed mother. Now he was going to die. Who is going to take care of his widowed mother? Here we find that Jesus entrusted John with the care of his mother. Thus we read that from that moment, John took Mary into his own house. In the language of Lenski, what a reversal of the facts. Had Jesus been dependent on Mary and not she on him? Had she during his ministry provided for him and not he for her? And since when all Christendom represented in John. No, Jesus is not adding to the burdens of Mary. Least of all, a world burden no human being can possibly bear. He is not deifying this woman nor making her to do what he alone can do and does for all of us. He is comforting his mother and burdening her, providing for her the support she needs. The sacred word of Jesus cannot be removed or rested or twisted to convey self-conceived ideas. Its sense is crystal clear and no man shall ever change it. Therefore the Roman Catholic teaching an interpretation of, a, of this passage is clearly a twisting of the meaning of scripture. It is a desperate effort to find biblical support for the cult of Mary that the, the Bible nowhere supports. But the thing I don't want you to miss is the significance of this event or scene that John records. It shows us the selfless love of Jesus even under intense pain and suffering. When he was in intense pain, or when we are in intense pain, our tendency is to forget others and just focus on ourselves. In fact, we tend to demand that others should do something to relieve us of our pain. And suffering. But that is not true of Jesus. No death was more painful than crucifixion. And there are graphic descriptions of what happens. I don't have to read to you this lengthy quotation. And in addition to the physical pain was the reality that the father was pouring out his wrath on his son in order to satisfy the claims of his justice, in order to provide a just basis for the forgiveness of sins for all of those whom Christ came to save. And that is what frightened Jesus the most, the wrath of his father. For the sins of his people. Yet, Jesus still had the time to focus on the earthly needs of his mother. Hanging on the cross. In pain and agony. 
when he saw his mother, remembered her name. John, take care of her. I will no longer be here. Take care of her. In the cross, the father was pouring out his wrath on his son. And yet, he still fought for the care of his mother. Now that is selfless. Love that does not seek its own. Love that is focused not on one's interest, but in the interest of the other. And Jesus, the perfect and awesome example and embodiment of it. When you're in pain, believe me, Tendency is to focus on yourself. Serve me. I'm in pain. But not him. He did ask in the sermon, pray with me. Keep watch with me. Don't leave me alone. But he will never, ever just focus on his own interests. Even in the most excruciating pain. And this is the selfless love of the Savior. Meant to contrast with the selfishness and callousness of the soldiers who divided Jesus' clothes among themselves. Note the language in verse 25. John intended this contrast. In verse 25, he said, Therefore, the soldiers did these things. But, and in the Greek, that's not the Greek word kai. It's the strong adversative, Allah. But, in contrast, to the soldiers, what they were doing in their selfishness and self-absorbed concern to get the most of this dying man. But, and then the contrast of Jesus. And what a contrast indeed. A heartless selfishness, callousness of the Roman soldiers and the compassion, selflessness, tenderness of the love of Jesus. There is no being like him. You will never meet anyone like him. There is no being more loving, more selfless, and carrying us Jesus. No friend like him. No brother like him. No king like him. No one like him. Even the most loving and caring mother cannot equal with him. If you do not know him, you don't know him. Why will you deny yourself knowing this being? Then that leads us to the final scene. In this account of John, the actual death of the Lord Jesus. The actual death. Verse 28. The actual death of Jesus. After this, Jesus knowing that all things have already been accomplished. To fulfill the scripture says, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. Therefore, when the Lord had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. 
Note that under the infallible guidance of the Spirit, emphasized here is that every part of Jesus' suffering was part of the Father's redemptive plan prophesied in the Old Testament Scripture, and it was a consequence of Jesus' active obedience to the will of the Father. This even includes the event when Jesus cried out, I am thirsty! which made the soldiers give him sour wine to drink, something that the scripture has prophesied about. Then after drinking the sour wine, Jesus knew this is the last. He said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now when Jesus said, it is finished, that the last die, we have to ask, what was finished? Well, what was finished was not only the sufferings Jesus was to endure because now he is about to die. That is too indefinite. That does not answer the question, what, why did he have to die? Why did he have to do all that was prophesied of him to accomplish what was he trying to accomplish? What was finished? Well, what was finished was his representative sin bearing. The death of Jesus finishes his work of accomplishing salvation, his work of reconciliation and atonement. That specific work is now brought to a close. The Lamb of God has made this great sacrifice. It is in this that it is now done. Christ as the substitute, representative sin bearer, had paid the great price of ransom and paid it to the uttermost part. It is finished indeed. He still continues to do the work of accomplishing salvation. He is still the mediatorial priest. But this central work of Christ to accomplish salvation is done once for all. He still continues to intercede for his people in glory. He still continues to battle with the devil. He still continues to do his work. To subjugate entire, the entire creation. But this part of his work. The work of atonement. Representative sin bearing. Is done. And it's done forever. The words can be translated. It is finished. And it stands finished. It's done. And other portions of the scripture bear witness of this. Particularly in the book of Hebrews. That the offering that Christ made, he made once for all. For all the sins of those whom he came to die. That even those Old Testament sacrifices, the nature was that it was repeated over and over and over and over again. Because they could never take away sin. And it only pointed to the need of a one sacrifice that God will provide. That will end all of those sacrifices that can never take away sin. They simply serve to remind the people. That those sacrifices repeated over and over again does not have the power to atone for sin, but only a temporary reprieve of the judgment of God upon the Jewish nation. And that they needed a better sacrifice. A sacrifice that will put an end to all. A sacrifice that once for all will provide a just basis for the forgiveness of sins. And there are so many scriptures in the book of Hebrews along that line. So this cry of Jesus, it is finished, 
recorded in Scripture, rings out to the entire world. In Christ's death, God has provided a just, a complete, and all-sufficient basis for the forgiveness of sin and reconciliation with God. In His atoning death, we have the, all the sacrifice that we need to atone for all of our sins. This is what makes the Roman Catholic theology of the Mass and indulgence so utterly against the teachings of Scripture. In a Roman Catholic catechism, it says, In the Holy Mass, one and the same sacrifice. Is the Holy Mass one and the same sacrifice with that of the cross? Answer, the Mass is one and the same sacrifice with that of the cross, inasmuch as Christ who offered himself a bleeding victim on the cross to his heavenly Father continues to offer himself in an unbloody manner on the altar to the ministry of his priest. And I, what I can't even understand is why in an unbloody manner when supposedly the wine turns to blood? It's a mumbo-jumbo of words. And this is a denial of the teachings of Christ, that when he offered that sacrifice, it is final, once for all, never to be repeated. And this is to deny the cry of Jesus when he was about to die. It is finished. So listen, if you want forgiveness of sin, you can only find it in Jesus. That's where you find it. You will find it only in Him. You will not find it in a Roman Mass. You will not find it in Mary. You will not find it in giving charity. You will not earn it by buying indulgence. That's the biggest fraud. You can only find forgiveness in Christ. Ephesians 1.7 In Him, in Christ, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. Where do you find forgiveness? In Christ. In that one sacrifice He offered in Calvary. If you believe in Him, if you trust Him, you will receive forgiveness for all of your sins. You will be reconciled with God. This God that you are so afraid of, this God who you are trying to run away from, this God who you know and yet you want to suppress whatever knowledge you have of that God because you are afraid of Him. You don't have to keep running. You don't have to keep suppressing the truth in unrighteousness because in Him there is forgiveness. In His Son. So here are some scenes of Jesus' crucifixion and death. Frequently revisit these scenes. Understand their significance. Live in the light of and particularly as we partake of the Lord's Supper. Let's take one or any of those scenes that you find most helpful and remember Him. Feed your soul with the truth and feed therefore your soul 